Hello and welcome to Book Lust. I'm Nancy Pearl. My guest today is writer Nick Harkaway. His newest book is Carla's Choice. Nick, it's such a pleasure to have you on the show. Um, I have wanted to interview you for years and I'm so glad it worked out. It's a pleasure to be here. Hi, at last. Hi. <laughs> Um, I'm a big fan. Uh, I was a big fan of your father's, John le Carre. Um, and your newest book, Carla's Choice, actually um, is based on characters and situations created by your father, um, which I have to say, as uh, a, a huge fan of, of, the, of uh, George Smiley and the Tinker Tailor um, books is how I think of them, um, I, I was thrilled that that you had done that, and I, I think the book just really does a marvelous job capturing that world and that voice and 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 those individuals. So, <laughs> thank you. Um, so, how did it all come about? Uh, we were talking as a family uh, last year, and. Uh, I had sort of decided we, we'd had a conversation about whether we should ask someone to write another smiley book. And I had decided in my head that that shouldn't be me. I was just not going to do it, you know, um, for all the all the same reasons you would imagine. And then uh, my brother Simon in this meeting said, well, I, you know, I think there's, and we've talked about, you know, the possibility we might get someone to do that before we talk about anybody else. I think there's a fairly strong argument that it should be you. So will you do it? And when somebody says that, it, when they ask you to do it, particularly when it's your family, it's completely different from the conversation that you're having in your head, uh, because it's no longer, you know, do I dare and, you know, have I, have I got the sheer effrontery to do this? It's like, oh, they want me to do this. And then all the reasons that, you know, that it's hard, it's challenging, you know, it, it can go wrong, you know, all that stuff suddenly becomes the reason why you should do it. Um, so I said, um, give, can I have a couple of weeks just to kind of work out whether I can? And I reread all the Smiley novels and I sat down and I kind of, and I wrote little bits of stuff, not story, just kind of like, like you would paint if you were choosing a color for a wall and going, would it work like this? Would it work like this? Um, you know, and by the end of the two weeks, I was like, I want to do this. Like, I really want to do this. Um, you know, and thank goodness Simon kind of did that because otherwise I would have said, no, 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 we should get someone else. Um, you know, so so yeah, I mean, it was a it was a surprise to me too, um, but I, you know, it's really exciting. When you went back and read the books, how did you decide the book, your book, Carla's Choice, is set in between the events of um, the spy who came in from the cold? And Tinker Tailor Soldier Spy. How how did you? Was that an obvious place to put the book for I you? I don't know if it's I don't know if it's obvious. It's 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 certainly uh, it's a really good place for it to go. Oh because yeah. But uh, in Spy Coming from the Cold, you have you know this, the the classic book, and but Carla is not mentioned. And then in uh, in Tinker Tailor, you have the the beginning of the trilogy and the first mention of Carla and this kind of construction of of the circus as a world, as an infrastructure, as a bureaucracy, as an environment, and it has a history, and that history goes back before Spy became it from the cold. But none of those things, you know, is in the original book because he's not building a franchise at that point; he's just writing novels. And so you've got this ten year or nine year gap between these two extraordinary books, and that's enough time to do something entirely its own. You're not just writing infill. You get to say, okay, you know, we can do this, and we can build this, we can break it again, we can go to places, and we can come back again, and all that can belong to whatever story you're telling into that space. And then at the very end of that, you can then join on very neatly, if you need to, back into Tinker Tailor, having done nothing bad and enriched or, you know, kind of enlightened it a little bit, but really just having told a sequence of stories that belongs to itself. Um, and that was really important. And, and you know, it just, it felt narratively like the place to be. 
Mm -hmm. I, I, I was trying to think of where else it could possibly be. Um, but, but that decade where George has left the circus um, after the events of, of um, the spy who came in from the cold and, and then is back in, in Tinker Taylor seemed like the, the, the place that would give you as, as a creator and a writer the biggest canvas to work on because you don't want to be hampered I think that's right. And then the other thing that I looked at was between Honorable Schoolboy and Smiley's People, where there is also a gap. It's not determined quite how long the gap is. Um, but you could have the stories of Smiley as the caretaker chief of the circus. But when, when you're the caretaker chief of the circus, you're not the foot soldier anymore. You can't go plodding around into dark alleys and asking silly questions and so on. You know, you have to be... Um, above the fight, and that's not nearly so much fun. This is Smiley when he's allowed to go and, and be Sherlock Holmes, be Poirot, you know, and, and do the good stuff, and be a little bit disobedient. Right. When I was reading Carla's Choice, my thought was, I, you, I thought, you know, Nancy, you have not reread The Spy Who Came In From The Cold in, like, decades, and and then I went out and got it. So, I mean, I think that one of the things that's going to happen is there's going to be a huge rush on the spy who came in from the cold because so much of the book that you wrote plays off of those events. I think, I mean, so it's it comes directly after Spy, and so there's an instinct to go and, and read Spy, but actually it plays towards Tinker Taylor. It does. You know, it drives you, you know, so my hope is that it gets everybody back into the smiley stories, which, I mean, i got to say... You know, as, as we look at the world and the place it's in, uh, a discussion of what the Cold War looked like doesn't feel out of place. Right. Uh, you know, uh, but also just, you know, because part of the part of the impetus for doing this was that when we inherited the literary estate, we inherited it with an obligation, a request that we try to get broaden the audience, continue the, the audience through time. That was that's the whole gig for us. You know, is is my dad wanted to be remembered and you know, and remembered as a novelist, read as a novelist. And the, you know, people talk about when you say, you know, it's very hard to know which books will will be read in 50 years or 100 years. I think with Victorian novels, that's probably true. You know, it's kind of a lottery. But now we live in a world with very kind of structured and quantified markets and attention economies and so on. And if you want something to persist, you've got to steal some attention for it. And the ways in which you do that are kind of knowable and fairly limited. And the, the, the most obvious is if you have new material. Mm -hmm. When you were working on the book that became Carla's Choice, your, fa your father's books, he, he was angry about the way the world was. Mm -hmm. do, do, do you share that anger and do you think that comes out in Carla's Choice or was it more frustration? I couldn't so decide. He was increasingly angry as he got older, which is always fantastic. I feel in the Smiley novels, he's he's angry, but he's also driven by a compassion. He sees the human dimension in an impossible meat grinder of geopolitics. And he's interested really in that, in, in the effects on the people. And, you know, he, he wants to say, how do you find the right action in a bad place? Um, and then, and that theme continues into the later books, but then you also get very specific political angers directed at particular movements, particular moments, and so on. Um, and I mean, you know, I, I do share those things. And he and I, for example, we went on his birthday a few years ago, we went and marched on the Brexit march, um, or the anti-Brexit march, you know, um, uh, because, uh, you know, that was, that that felt like a thing we, you know, we, we weren't really cross about. Um, uh, you know, so yeah, I mean, I share those, but I, I didn't want to try to cross the streams too much in, in Carla's Choice. I wanted to play into that, that anger and optimism and despair that comes out of compassion, more than pointing at a specific thing and saying, you know, this is a, this is a bad thing. Because I, 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 transplanting a, a modern horror into the 1963 is something that can go sour on you. I think it's better you take the story as it is and let it teach what it has to teach about people and compassion and 
hope that that applies in a modern context, which I, you know, I believe it does anyway. Right. To the extent that, you know, I was sort of adding stuff in there, I wanted to focus attention a little bit on, in the UK, I don't know how it is in the US, in the UK, we don't educate ourselves properly about the history of Central and Eastern Europe. And it matters terribly now, you know, but, you know, we don't really look at the the, the the map and say wow you know the Danube flows from Germany all the way to Odessa and into the into the Black Sea and that's the same Black Sea where you can sail past Crimea to to Rostov on Don and into the into the canal network there and into Central Russia like that's that's a revelatory kind of you know a lot of people go oh wow can you do that so like, yes and that's a, that's a strategic <laughs> corridor which matters right now in a huge way you know and I mean. I have a, a global security politics degree, and I wasn't, you know, confident on that stuff going into uh, going into writing this book. I had to kind of read up, and of course, now there's an app you can watch the shipping go up and down the Danube, which, by the way, is fascinating, right? I mean, of course, it is. Wow, was there something when that you discovered? So the two saddest books in that whole Carla thing for me are the Spy Who Came In from the Cold, which is heartbreaking. And the honorable schoolboy, which is yeah. equally heartbreaking. <laughs> um, you know, the other, the other, the trilogy that that central trilogy, I, I think, um, doesn't. And this doesn't take away from anything like my enjoy, my love for them, but but they don't break your heart. It, 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 maybe they should. You know, maybe the betrayal of Bill Hayden should break your heart, but it didn't in the same way. I think they take people in different ways, but yeah, I think you know the, definitely the, the that that middle story, the honourable schoolboy, is is it's really interesting that one because uh, a lot of the time in bookshops you'll find Tinker Tailor and Smiley's people, but not the honourable schoolboy because right. it's longer, it's more complex, you know. Um, and then every so often you meet somebody for whom the honourable schoolboy is like the only book, like everything else is is building to that or the consequence of that, and the honourable schoolboy is the one, the defining Le Carre novel. And I had to look at that, and I had to look at Spy and and Murder of Quality and To Call for the Dead and so on, and say, okay, where am I? What you know? What are we doing here? Because when you look at the first three books, they are shorter, less immediately complex. They have sort of declarative language, simple structure. They're more like a kind of noir detective story than they are the later books, which are very much more convoluted, more, you know, the prose is, is more ornamented, and there's a lot going on. And it, it feels to me like, I, you know, while I'm telling Carla's choice and whatever else I do next, I, I have to move also through that process. You can't, you, you have to leave Spy Coming from the Cold and be able to step straight into Carla's Choice if that's what you're doing. Obviously, it's a standalone book, but if you are coming at it from, from Spy Coming from the Cold, you have to be able to go there. And then, you know, at the far end, you have to be able to step into Tinker Taylor without going, whoa, what, what just happened? Right, yeah. Was there something in those books when you were rereading them or when you came to write Carla's Choice that made you wish your your dad had made a different choice about a particular plot point or did you wish that you could argue with him about I mean I argue with him uh, you know I can argue with him at any time I mean although, <laughs> actually we agreed so much on so many things it's uh, arguments were pretty rare but um, I don't think there's anything that I look at and go I wish you hadn't done that there are a couple of places where I go um you know, well, I mean, just things like when you go from Tinker Taylor to Honorable Schoolboy, the, the year changes. The, the the date of Control's death shifts by 12 months. Mm -hmm. And, I mean, you know, the kind of the, the precision maniac in me kind of gets a bit <laughs> um, You know, but but actually for me, that's, that's fantastic because what it means is, you know, there's a lot of information which is given only partially in the sequence. Um, you know, you, you know a little bit about the history of Carla, but not much. You know a little bit about the history of Percy Adeline's career, but you can't put the pieces together in a way that you know is perfect. So actually what that means is that I can move the pieces around right. without crossing any lines. Um, and, and similarly, if you've got dates that shift in the existing franchise, to some degree, you're liberated by the fact that you cannot get it right because you will dovetail with with Tinker Taylor or with Honorable Schoolboy. You can't do both at the same time. 
Um, you know, which means that actually you're liberated if you need to, sh to to shuffle something six months in one direction or another. It's not the end of the world. Which one of the great things for me about this was I wanted to to be made to color inside the lines. Like I don't normally write books into a recognizable genre. I you know I tend to kind of if, if I see a genre, I want to break it and smash it together with something else. And here was an opportunity to take this kind of apprenticeship with my father in in being you know, inside the inside in one place, in one zone, doing a recognizable thing. But within that, I still have the freedom to move things around and stretch time a little bit if I need to. Mm -hmm. I, I've talking about spy fiction um, as a as a genre. I've, I've the way I think about it is that for contemporary Britain, I mean, that it's that we we talk about the Arthurian legends as the matter of Britain, but but I think for the twentieth century, the matter of Britain begins with you know Philby. I wonder. I mean, I think it's all. I mean, you see this in my father's books. There's imperial decline going on, something which we still haven't come to terms with. You know, you look at our politics and how they work, and. You know, it, a lot of the time it's still about, you know, how can we arrange to have an outsized influence on the world? Why are we not being given the right level of respect? And, you know, and you kind of, you want to go, you know, because we don't do that stuff anymore, which is a good thing. So now we have to be this this new country that we haven't figured out yet. But, you know, we've got a lot of stuff that we, we need to work out before we can do that. Um, so this imperial decline in that story, I think Philby, for people of my father's generation and for the establishment, Philby and Blunt later on, um, were absolutely astonishing because, as everybody says, you know, quote unquote, he was one of us. Like, we, we knew he couldn't be a spy because he was one of us. Right. Um, and there's a there's a, an episode of of the satirical show uh, Yes Prime Minister or Yes Minister I can't remember which one it was uh, which which is our kind of early 1980s West Wing um, you know which has a whole sequence about well you know Sir John Halstead couldn't be a spy because he was one of us and of course he was right it becomes increasingly obvious because it's a comedy show it becomes increasingly obvious that he was doing everything except running around Westminster wearing a Soviet flag shirt you know and they're all going no 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 no. Um, but to a weird degree with Philby, they kind of did that, you know, and it's my, you know, my, my uh, father's father was a confidence trickster, um, among his many other failings, most of which were worse, but he was a professional con man. And dad said about him that Ronnie loved to take it to the edge. And then when he was on the edge, he was unsatisfied. He got away with being on the edge. So then he'd take it over the edge and see if he could still get away with it. And the example that, the, that he gave was that Ronnie and his guys had a, had a con going where they'd found a guy who would, uh, who would survey houses for them after the war. And, they would, and the guy would say, this house has been badly damaged when it wasn't. So they'd buy up a house and they'd say, yes, bomb damage from, from the German bombing. Very sad, beautiful house, needs a lot of repair work. And they'd get a government subsidy, which was, you know, to, to rebuild it. And of course, they didn't need the money. So they'd pocket the money and they'd just kind of give it a coat of paint. That would be great. And they ran out of houses that had been built before 1945. So at that moment, you pack up and you go home, like you're done. It's been nice, but it's finished. But they started using houses that had built, been built after the end of the war. <laughs> and lo and behold, all the police in London fell out of the sky, and they were all arrested. You're like, well, of course you were. What did you think was going to happen? You know, but Philby was doing that with spying. He was like, well, if I do this outrageous thing, right. yeah. you know, will, will the universe still love me enough to let me get away with it? How, how about if I, you know, how about if I appear on television with, with I don't know, with Stalin? Will that do it? You know, it's, it's extraordinary, the, the degree of, of kind of, and that's actually very common with, with um, those kind of flamboyant spies. If you, if you look at the history of a lot of them, they, you know, they get caught doing something nuts. And, and then very often they've supplied information which is critical and which, if their own side would just believe them, would change the course of history. And their own side is like, yeah, he's crazy. Like, that's <laughs> not happening right now. So you can ignore that. And then it turns out to be true. And he's, you know, he's in the background going. You know? <laughs> and, 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 uh, and they're just going, oh, wow, you know, we thought you were just drunk in a bar in Lisbon. We had no idea that was true. 
you know, it's the relationship. I'm fascinated by this at the moment. The relationship between the agent handler and the agent. The agent handler doesn't trust the agent, and vice versa. And yet somehow they have to trust each other more than they trust anybody else. Yeah. That's extraordinary. So do you, oh, so two quick questions. One is, are you going to continue um, writing, I'm going to call it your own work. I mean, please yeah. understand the way I mean it. I mean, do you have like books on tap? Because I'm a big fan of Nick Harkaway's books. Nick Harkaway's <laughs> books are not going anywhere. So I have the, the, the next uh, Cal Sounder book is coming up and I'm editing right now a book that I was writing in 2020. Uh, which then just got swallowed up by Titania Noir and then by this and so on, um, which I'm incredibly excited about. No one's seen it yet. Like, and, and it's going to be one of those things where um, usually what happens when I when I deliver a book is that some poor editor somewhere has to sit there and go, well, what do we do with this? Like, this isn't like anything else you've done. We can't define the genre. And the marketing team and the sales team are sitting there going, well, I mean, we'll, you know, we'll do whatever we do. Maybe it'll take away, <laughs> you know. Um, and, and, you know, and so it's another of those. Uh, someone's going to enjoy that moment. Um, because w when I when I said yes, I'll do Carla's Choice, and yes, I'll you know potentially do more if if you know if that's something people want. I also said, look, but I have to be able to do the, the other stuff, not just because I love writing it, which which I do, but because it's actually it turns out if I'm not able to go off the rails a little bit, I, I get as a person I get very grumpy and confused about kind of what I'm doing with my life and I start thinking you know maybe I should retrain and, and be an environmental lawyer which is like my there's the theme of my life uh, is what should I be doing what you know instead of this um that is, is of greater use to mankind and um you know so actually I need the I need the ability to do both I need the space to do both which I have but partly because I write quite quickly so you know it's not the end of the world I can do uh one le carré every two years if that's you know if that's if that's what is desired in, in the world so no. well thank you so much for um talking to me about the book and about you as a writer and um i i just um i'm just thrilled that we got to talk it's really but, nice to see you yes yes and if you come to uh, seattle i hope we can meet in person thank you so much it's great to talk <laughs>